Phoenix Colden was an endlessly inquiring, spirited, and musically talented young woman. Her dedications to religion and giftedness in the arts were cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in December of 2011, leaving all who knew her, both in life and through the world wide web, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination at the disappearance of Phoenix Colden and the mystery at the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue. This is Cold Case Detective. <laughs> Phoenix Colden was born on May the 23rd, 1988, to parents Gloria and Lawrence Colden. After spending some time of her youth in the sunny state of California, Lawrence's job moved the family to the greater St. Louis, Missouri area, where they spent the remainder of their time together. The Coldens moved into a residential neighborhood of Spanish Lake, a quiet and middle-class suburb where Gloria and Lawrence would commit to raising their bright and beloved daughter. From an early age, Phoenix was raised in a world surrounded by church and Christian values. Her parents kept a close eye on her demeanor and social interactions, making sure she kept true to kindness, compassion, and respect. This was coupled by a strong attraction to music and instrumentation, as Phoenix developed a profound talent for the musical arts. Every Saturday morning, she would practice on the family's piano, quickly falling in love with the craft and finding a means in which to express herself. Phoenix's time at home increased when she entered middle school. After her parents decided that she was better off in homeschool rather than attend a public institution, while it continued to shelter Phoenix from interacting with a different world than what she was accustomed to, she never batted an eye. Her enthusiasm for learning, knowledge, and participating in academics was second to none, and she excelled in all of her studies. When she wasn't doing coursework or making music, Phoenix was advancing her fencing skills, attending rigorous practices that led her to ultimate championing of the sport, as she retained the local junior fencing title. From 2007 to 2011, Phoenix attended the University of Missouri St. Louis moving into an apartment with a friend. Around this time, Phoenix started displaying a different side of her personality, struggling to reconcile with her sheltered upbringing and strict lifestyle. She began arguing with her parents more frequently and participated in risky behavior, while it was a contrast to the normal Phoenix that her parents knew. Neither Gloria or Lawrence figured it to be any more than the pains of entering adulthood. That is, until May of 2011, when Phoenix returned home at the demand of her mother and tensions skyrocketed. Throughout the next few months, Phoenix's abnormal behavior hit an all-time high when she broke off her closet friendship with her longtime neighbor, Akira. After an argument forced Phoenix to admit she was uneasy about something in her life, something that would not be cracked by either Akira or the Colden family. As the warmth of summer turned to the chills of winter, Phoenix's crisis worsened. Her parents and few friends described her as a different person. No longer was she the well-balanced, soulful woman with the great sense of humor, strong in her faith, naive about the world, and ambitious to live up to the world's expectations. Instead, she was a shell of her former self. Both Gloria and Lawrence Colden felt that their daughter's own self was on the brink of returning but sadly never knew for sure when on a silent Sunday afternoon, Felix walked out of her Spanish Lake home for the final time, not to be seen or heard from again, leaving nothing behind but odds and ends in her car, abandoned in the middle of the road of St. Clair Avenue. Sometime in the year 2005, Phoenix Colden meets Akira in the Spanish Lake neighborhood, 
and the two quickly become good friends. Because Phoenix is homeschooled, she waits by the bus stop each day for when Akira arrives home after public school. Phoenix isn't allowed to go over to the Hogan household much, so her relationship with Akira and her mother Martini consists of talking on the front porch. The Hogans saw Phoenix's parents as a little too strict as a result. In the fall of 2007, Phoenix enrolls in the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Eager to explore lifestyles differing from the religious, tempered world she knew growing up. Around the time of starting college classes, Phoenix meets a guy named Michael B. They soon enter a romantic relationship, despite her parents' disapproval of him. Over the next few years, Phoenix and Michael B. hide most of their intimacy from the Colden family. They move into an apartment together with the help of Phoenix's mother, Gloria who signs the lease under the impression that her daughter is moving in with a female friend. Gloria proceeds to visit the flat multiple times in the duration Phoenix lives there, and not once sees a clue that alerts her a man is living there. At some point in 2010, Phoenix informs her childhood friend Akira back at home that she wants to leave Michael B, but isn't sure about how to go about it. Instead, she starts meeting other men, one of the men is another person named Michael, referred to as Cell Phone Mike. Phoenix heats up a second romantic relationship with Cell Phone Mike, behind the back of Michael B. Around the same time, Phoenix purchases an alternative cell phone plan behind the back of her parents. She uses the burner phone to communicate with Cell Phone Mike, and her phone from the family plan to upkeep her normal life with Gloria, Lawrence, and Michael B. In the months leading up to spring of 2011, Phoenix secretly steals money out of the Colden family's safe in their home. The money in question is in the form of savings bonds under Gloria Colden's name. Phoenix discreetly cashes these bonds at various points, pulling in around $2,500. What happens to this money is unknown. When May of 2011 arrives, Phoenix moves back in with her parents Per their request, after they decide paying for the apartment is financially difficult, and their house is technically closer than her apartment is to the university. The situation begins to unravel in the summer of 2011, when Phoenix has a mental breakdown in front of her friend Akira. Phoenix claims she has the feeling that she's being followed, specifically saying that an anonymous person or people are watching her and the Colden family in the park one day. It is a paranoid discussion with an unsettling foreshadowing, in which Phoenix shares she has a feeling that something is after her, and something is going to happen. On November the 15th, 2011, Phoenix records a selfie video on her phone, while she sits in her car, expressing the extreme frustration she has with herself, and the emotional crisis she's in. Phoenix appears distressed, and on the verge of tears, saying things like she wishes she could start over, she also recites an altered version of the Serenity Prayer. During Thanksgiving break later in the month, Phoenix meets with an old friend from her teenage years, Tim Baker. She confides in him that despite telling people she's at the university, she never actually enrolled in classes that semester. Keeping the secret from her family, Tim knows about the second burner phone and realizes Phoenix is living a double life and feels like she's hiding something from him too. Not long afterwards, sometime at the end of November or early December, Phoenix has another fiery incident with Akira. This time she argues with her best friend about petty little issues regarding their friendship and Michael B. It escalates when Phoenix reveals she carries a 10 inch dagger knife stored in the driver's side door of her car. Akira thinks Phoenix is just trying to intimidate her and claims she's done nothing wrong. After Phoenix hints that she's going somewhere to get away, Akira claims this mental state is totally abnormal for Phoenix, and like Tim Baker, feels that her friend is hiding something. Throughout the first weeks of December, Phoenix makes an increasing number of phone calls to her original boyfriend, Michael B, via her family plan cell phone. On December the 17th, she engages in 10 separate phone conversations ending with a 116 minute call, unknown as to what it is about, and if it played a role in the mind-numbing mystery about to unfold. 
At 9.34 a.m. on December the 18th, 2011, Phoenix makes a two-minute phone call to her friend Rosie, again using her family-planned cell phone. Five minutes later, at 9.41 a.m., Phoenix makes a six-minute call to Michael B. on the same cell phone as before. At 11 a.m., Phoenix attends the morning service with her mother, Gloria, at their usual church. Phoenix performs in the handbell choir and appears like her normal self to the congregation's pastor, Mark Miller. After church, Phoenix makes the last recorded cell on her family-planned cell phone to Michael B., a call that only lasts one minute with unknown details. Not much time passes before Phoenix and Gloria run an errand to the grocery store around 2 p.m. On the way home to Spanish Lake, Phoenix turns to Gloria and says, Mom, we need to get back to the way we used to be. Gloria responds asking, what do you mean, Phoenix? And Phoenix says, we just need to be more what we used to be like. Gloria figures the old version of her daughter is coming back. Five minutes past 3 p.m., later that afternoon, Phoenix walks past her father, silent yet determined. She hops into a black 1998 Chevy Blazer and backs out of the driveway. This is the last known sighting of Felix Colden. About two and a half hours later, at 5.27 p.m., East St. Louis police officer Perry receives a call about an abandoned car in the middle of the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue. Officer Perry arrives on the scene in eight minutes at 9.35 p.m. and finds an empty black Chevy Blazer sitting in the middle of the road near a stop sign. Assuming the vehicle ran out of gas, Officer Perry checks out the interior. He finds the engine is not running, the lights are off, bearing no purse or phone inside, no sign of struggle, and resting there like any normal parked car would. He runs the license plates to see if it comes up as a stolen car in the database, but produces no hits. He calls a local towing company and runs the VIN number, confirming that the car was actually from Missouri and probably crossed state lines on a routine drive. Officer Perry enters the car's data into a nationwide car logging system, but a delay in the program causes the vehicle to remain absent from the National Impound Registry. Later in the evening, the car is taken into an Illinois car and truck impound lot, but the owners of the vehicle are not contacted. The next morning, on December the 19th, Gloria and Lawrence awake and immediately feel concerned for their daughter, who never stays out all night and hasn't been heard from since the previous afternoon. When Gloria calls law enforcement and provides Phoenix's date of birth, the police announce that because Phoenix is a legal adult and has only been gone less than 24 hours, there's no reason to believe she's missing. Gloria persists and informs the officers over the phone that Phoenix was in the 1998 Chevy Blazer, so they run a vehicle check. However, no red flags pop up in the system, despite the impound on the 18th. Over the next couple of weeks, the Colden family searches endlessly for their daughter. They pass out flyers, call nearby hospitals, and visit potential hiding spots around town. Gloria even calls multiple local news stations, but none of them air Phoenix's story or help spread awareness. At the end of December, Gloria and Lawrence are informed one of their vehicles has been impounded at an East St. Louis car lot. They rush across the Mississippi River to find their Chevy Blazer exactly how Officer Perry found it, strewn with odds and ends belonging to Phoenix, but showing no signs of conflict. Gloria feels Phoenix was most certainly not the one who put the car on St. Clair Avenue. While Lawrence gets a sense that Phoenix is ultimately okay. On New Year's Day 2012, authorities finally pick up the case and declare Phoenix Colden an official missing person. A little over a week later, on January the 9th, Phoenix's profile is first reported by news outlets and is given special spotlight by Sean Drea Thomas on January the 25th who then accidentally shares false information about the state of the Chevy Blazer found on December the 18th, leading viewers to believe Phoenix had been taken from the car with its engine still running and door ajar. In February of 2012, the Colden family hires a private investigator, Steve Foster, to find Phoenix. Along with the local police department, detectives interview all known suspects, including both of the Michael boyfriends, who are cleared after interrogation. This would be the only time either boyfriend spoke out about the case. 
and their transcripts have not been released. Steve Foster also discovers Phoenix's safe-stealing habits, which leads to the reveal of Phoenix Colden's second birth certificate under the name of Phoenix Reeves, her mother's maiden name. Over the next couple of years, tens of thousands of tips come in regarding potential sightings of Phoenix. However, none bear any real fruit. These false wolf cries force the Colden family into spending more money they had on PIs to track breadcrumb trails with dead ends, leaving the family no choice but to foreclose their home without any tangible hope. The police are unable to find any real clues or physical evidence either. In 2018, Oxygen Television Network videotapes a separate investigation into the disappearance of Phoenix, with the original investigative reporter, Shondria Thomas, and a retired police deputy, Joe Delia. The two comb through the major points in the case and bring in a third private investigator, Dean Duke, to run a detailed database analysis of the second birth certificate of Phoenix. The system reveals only four matches in the United States. Three of them are ruled out with complete profiles. However, one sticks out as peculiar. The final Phoenix Reeves match has no date of birth, no social security number, and no relatives. Just an address for a house in Anchorage, Alaska, that was active from January to June 2012. Joe and Dean travel to Alaska and interview the neighbors around the address regarding Phoenix. However, none recognize her name from her missing posters. They eventually contact the woman now living in the house that was matched in the database. But the woman says that she's been the sole owner of the place since 2002 and has never seen or heard of Phoenix, neither with the Reeves nor Colden surname. While both private investigators are convinced this suspicious profile is that of the real Phoenix Colden, they have little else to go on. This is the most recent development of the still frozen solid disappearance. When looking across the entirety of Phoenix's cold case, there are plenty of curious items that could play a major role in the investigation. However, the one piece of evidence that provides the most critical information about Phoenix and her train of thought is the selfie video she recorded on November the 15th, 2011, just shy of one month prior to her vanishing. Unfortunately, the entire video itself has not been released to the public, but there are intriguing pieces of direct quotes from Phoenix originating from video that we've collected for the case file. She starts off by claiming she got ditched by an anonymous person or persons. She follows up by saying, this is ridiculous, I just want to start over. I just feel like I can't start the new me over. A few moments pass and she continues with, I don't know, I've got to see things for what they are. You know, like instead of thinking about it like that, see things for what they are. Phoenix trails off, saying a few inaudible lines before looking into the camera and reciting a version of the Serenity Prayer as Lord please help me accept the things that won't change and that I won't change the things that I can't change. Further along the video, Phoenix explains that's why I don't like talking to people when I'm mad or whatever because I say stuff that I don't mean and that's when you learn to hold your composure. I want people to take me seriously. Due to the poor quality of the sound and a few moments where Phoenix was mumbling, it's hard to make out what she's saying. Investigators Shondria Thomas and Joe Delia took the video to an audio engineer, Brian Queskin, to clean up the audio and decipher the rest of the dialogue. He unveils a portion where Phoenix says, I just want to be happy. I feel so stupid because I let myself go a little bit. I probably would have been in a better situation if I would have stuck with how I used to be. She then proceeds to say, might as well ride in the back with the cops all up in here. The only person that won't let me down is me. It's unknown how much longer her self-reflection goes on for. But at the end of the video, Phoenix gives one last look into the camera and says bye. Throughout the conversation she has with herself, Phoenix takes plenty of long pauses looking outside the window with a somber, agitated demeanor. Her voice is mellow, soft, and sometimes indistinguishable, yet doesn't come across as calm. Rather, Phoenix sounds as if she's truly worried about the state she's in, consciously struggling with her life in that moment, 
compared to the good-natured lifestyle she lived in prior. It's in these moments that Phoenix herself clarifies she has been a completely different person, for better or for worse. Some investigators theorise that Phoenix references a situation that's put her in legal trouble, or that she's hanging around a bad crowd of people who are pushing her to want out. Regardless, it's clear Phoenix is struggling with internal conflict, most likely as a result of external pressures. She seems to rely on no one but herself, and her trust in the people around her is obviously deteriorating. Despite the tense atmosphere, however, Phoenix displays her sensitivity and cognitive ability to understand the world. She's attempting to decipher the present by working through the past to hopefully set up a brighter future. Sadly though, the timing of the video, and being so close to the disappearance, leads all involved to believe her crisis played a major role in the events that mysteriously unfolded. In the seven years since Phoenix's cold case has entered the public sphere, the most discussed theory revolves around a possible human trafficking incident. When her disappearance was first reported, a rumour started that the 1998 Chevy Blazer driven by Phoenix was discovered on the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue with the engine running. The lights on and the driver's side door swung open. This version of the story implies that Phoenix was most likely taken out of the car by a second party and the Chevy was untouched. So who could have kidnapped Phoenix from her vehicle with sudden force? Well, it just so happens that the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue is positioned right next to the Interstate 70 Highway, branded as the Human Trafficking Highway of America. Not only that, but the area surrounding St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis are notorious for high levels of crime, gang and drug-related activity, and human trafficking itself. Thus, multiple theories suggest Phoenix was driving in East St. Louis for whatever suspect business she had involved herself in months prior, was targeted by a group of pimps or trafficking operatives, and taken away while at the stop sign and kidnapped into the underground oblivion. Human trafficking survivor Kat Summers believes the case had earmarks of usual trafficking situations, again pointing to the state of the car and degraded status of East St. Louis street life. Katie Rhodes, the founder of Healing Action, also felt like Phoenix was most likely pulled into the human trafficking sector. Although she claims Phoenix went into it with a sense of autonomy, Katie explained that pimps are master persuaders, often seducing their victims with the promise of freedom away from the control of parents. That would definitely be the case for Phoenix, who was unhappy living back at home and constantly fighting with her mother. If she was enticed to enter the realms of prostitution in exchange for independence, the pimp would have worked quickly to disorientate Phoenix and strip her personal life away. To add fuel to the fire, a woman from the local St. Louis Mothers of Missing Children group claims that in 2017, she received a message that included a link and a picture of Phoenix associated with a suspicious escort website. However, when investigators used the link, directed them to a fake Facebook page with Phoenix's picture in the profile image, proving to be nothing more than a cruel hoax. This wasn't the only alleged sighting of Phoenix throughout the years though. In March of 2014, an old friend, Kelly Fronert, reportedly sees Phoenix in a plane going home from Las Vegas. Kelly was seated on her flight during boarding and looked up, catching a glimpse of a woman who appeared to be Phoenix with a group of women, staring straight ahead. Kelly called her name, to which the woman looked up immediately and asked Kelly if she looked like someone. Kelly responded with, yeah, you look like my friend Phoenix. But this woman kept going, never engaging with Kelly again. She was wearing a zipped up jacket, nice jewelry, along with women all bearing the same likeness. There were two men in the group with them, pro football player types, in the age range of 35 to 40 years old. When they landed in St. Louis, Kelly disembarked and went to Southwest Airlines service counter, saying she saw a missing person on the flight. Police came and combed through the airport, but never found the woman thought to be Phoenix or her crew members. Kelly is adamant the woman was Phoenix Colden, rating her confidence a 9 out of 10 during the Oxygen documentary series. 
There isn't much evidence to refute the possibility that Phoenix disappeared into the human trafficking trade due to the geographic tendencies and history of East St. Louis. Yet it's hard to consider this when the state of the Chevy showed zero signs of struggle. While there were a few odds and ends strewn about the interior of the car, neither Phoenix's purse nor cell phone was found, unlike the original report stated. The car was abandoned rather than broken into, and unless Phoenix was taken somewhere and the car was dumped afterwards, it's unlikely Phoenix was forced out. This then leads people to believe Phoenix was lured away by someone she knew and murdered. St. Louis, Missouri is a top five city for violent crime in America, and many sleuths point to the boyfriend situation and the secret nature of her double life outside of Spanish Lake. Michael B was thoroughly investigated by police and early private detectives, and all parties are convinced he is innocent. While his alibi is unknown, cell phone Mike also makes sense as a suspect. In fact, cell phone Mike actually had a restraining order against him by a separate ex-girlfriend, who claimed he was both emotionally and physically violent. Not only this, but during Christmas time of 2011, a week after Phoenix disappeared, the ex-girlfriend states that cell phone Mike took special interest in missing person cases around the area, specifically checking up on the status of Phoenix's case, after authorities reported it official. When the ex-girlfriend confronted cell phone Mike about these interests, he said Phoenix had been a customer at the convenience store he worked at ending with a shouting match in which he asked, why are you worried about someone that's dead? The ex-girlfriend has since declared she is unsure if cell phone Mike was just assuming or knew for sure. Even with the two Michaels cleared by police, a potential murder makes sense when considering all of Phoenix's bank accounts, cell phone records, and social media posts came to an abrupt halt the day she vanished. She felt like she was being followed for months leading up to the disappearance and saw darkness on her horizon. The video she recorded stemmed from a hypothetical sticky situation in which she found herself in trouble, involving the police and more than likely a larger unknown number of people. Taking it all into account, it makes sense to believe Phoenix's involvement with folks outside of her known social circle led her to illegal doings. Her use of the burner phone was used to navigate these operations and on December the 18th, she went out to resolve a dispute, ending up a homicide victim at the hands of these anonymous connections. All that being said, police are aware of this second cell phone and haven't reported it as a piece connecting Phoenix to any criminal organization. And while it is possible that because the search is ongoing, law enforcement cannot unveil case details, there's just not enough observable evidence to indicate foul play is involved. There's no blood, no wanted suspects, and no DNA in the Chevy Blazer that belongs to anyone other than Phoenix, Gloria, or Lawrence Colden. Nevertheless, no theory can be completely ruled out with the bizarre events surrounding Phoenix's vanishing and life as a whole. Living two lives with one being a complete mystery to the people investigators have access to makes extracting leads and following clues unnaturally tedious and borderline impossible. Absorbing all of the information, interviews, and intelligence provided across the board by multiple private investigators, we've concluded that Phoenix Colden up and left Spanish Lake on her own accord, with the help of friends, at first using her pseudonym, Phoenix Reeves, and the alternative birth certificate before building a completely new identity and dissolving into society under a new independent position of power. First, let's discuss the abandoned Chevy Blazer, the contents of the car, mostly junk and random garments, leaving no signs of illicit activity or foul play. The collection agency notice regarding Phoenix's unpaid burner phone bill that was discovered makes people question why she would leave it behind so carelessly. But ultimately, it wouldn't matter because the phone was still under her name and easily accessible by authorities with investigative abilities. The vehicle itself looked parked and planted from first sight, according to Officer Perry, and was most likely used as a decoy maneuver by Phoenix or whoever was helping her leave. Putting the Chevy in East St. Louis would make it seem like something criminal encountered Phoenix and lead searchers on a wild goose chase when really it was more than likely camouflage. 
Once the car was set up, Phoenix most likely had another person drive her away, or had another car at the ready. In addition, there's a chance that Interstate 70 being so close as the trafficking highway of the US was merely a coincidence. In reality, it being a nearby escape route for a quick departure. It's also important to note that East St. Louis is across state lines in Illinois, which would later prove to throw a wrench in the initial search for Phoenix and the vehicle within the automobile database. The second key to the maze is Phoenix's immense critical thinking skills and subtle resourcefulness. Known associates of Phoenix described her as able to make friends with just about anyone, allowing her to adapt to a variety of situations and befriend people with specific sets of services. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Phoenix met friends of friends who could assist with leaving the community and restarting an anonymous life. Now, who these suspects might be and to the degree of their craft is unknown, but Phoenix did have a head start with two birth certificates. Using the Phoenix Reef document for secret plans wouldn't be tracked right away at all and would buy her precious time. She could make purchases, apply for a new social security number and access any number of resources outside of the Colden legacy. She was obviously smart enough to hide a second cell phone plan from her family and some of her friends and could have had any number of other phones or communication methods. Remember, she was also intermittently stealing savings bonds from her family safe before moving back home, a potential method of collecting funds for her future departure. When the two private investigators, Joe Delia and Dean Duke, discovered the Phoenix Reeves identification address in Anchorage, Alaska, they visited the neighborhood but came away empty-handed. Apparently, the woman who lived at the address under Phoenix Reeves owned the property during the months when Phoenix was linked to it, from January to June 2012. However, this woman had never rented it out since purchasing it in 2002, and never saw anyone who looked like Phoenix during her 25-year residency. Yet something isn't right about this anomaly. It just so happens that Phoenix Reeves' profile had zero information points except for an address that was dated just one month after Phoenix disappeared and appeared to be a sensible runaway location. Nobody in Anchorage would recognize Phoenix if she did indeed travel there to hide or plan a further identity transformation and would serve as an excellent middle ground between the United States and starting anew in a foreign place like Japan. It also can't be ruled out that Phoenix paid off the woman who owned the house on record. Either way, we believe there's something very suspicious about Anchorage, Alaska, and concur she was definitely there at some point after her vanishing. In addition, many friends and connections to Phoenix have been less than welcoming to reporters, investigators, and anyone looking for answers. While they haven't been necessarily silent, a lot of her friends simply do not want to talk. In a sense, this could be analyzed as guilt behavior, but we feel that the guilt comes from their role in helping Phoenix, not hurting her. To pull off a feat like running away and becoming invisible, one would need help from the outside. Phoenix could have been using her new acquaintances as assistants in disappearing, including someone like Michael B. Their phone conversations increased in the weeks leading up to December the 18th and ended with an abnormally long 116 minute call on December the 17th. We theorized the two hour talk was a final discussion about the master plan, and the one minute call on the 18th was Phoenix altering the plan's initiation, seeing as though it was her final call on the family plan phone. Again, it's possible more calls were made on the burner phone, but without those records, it cannot be stated with 100% certainty. Finally, when drawing this conclusion, we must address Phoenix's emotional and mental state at the time of December 2011. Multiple friends describe Phoenix as unlike her normal self. She was agitated, displeased, and uncomfortable. Her relationship with her mother became untenable at times, ending with arguments and disputes about various topics as Phoenix spaced further and further away at church. Not to mention, Phoenix was constantly looking over her shoulder, regretting decisions in the past that took her down a path of present complications. Most telling of all was Phoenix's spoken wishes to start her life over, to reset her problems and return to the old version of herself. It's quite possible that she tried to do so in between November the 15th and December the 18th, 
with a couple of clues hinting of such efforts. However, it couldn't overcome the cloud of darkness that hung over her head. As her friendship with Akira cracked and her paranoia skyrocketed, Phoenix was the product of an incredibly strict parenting style, sheltering her from real-world conflict and suppressing her social development. She was eager to expand her knowledge and experience life outside of the airtight rules found at the Colden household. But over and over again, she was rejected of these desires by her parents. This slowly ate away at the connection she had with Gloria and Lawrence, and sadly made it an easier decision to let go of the religious, conservative front that everyone knew her by. Leaving in her eyes was most likely not an easy choice, but a necessary decision to escape the decades of difficulties that eventually made life a losing battle. All that being said, Phoenix Colden's case is truly a puzzling predicament, and no stones can go unturned. One of the reasons we wanted to share her story is the complete lack of national coverage that Phoenix and the Colden family received at the time of the disappearance in 2011 and 2012, losing precious time in their search. Gloria and Lawrence had to foreclose their home recently due to mounting investigation costs and are desperate for their daughter and her case to be shared to a wider audience. They fear her files will be swept into a corner and forgotten about. So we are doing all we can to keep the wick blazing with hope that Phoenix will be found. This is also the second case in which our subject has a connection to Anchorage, Alaska, a complete coincidence only realized after we research these cases. If any viewers are local to the area, please keep a special eye out for clues or leads into the profiles of Trevor Dealey and Felix Colden, or Phoenix Reeves. However unlikely, you just never know what could be lurking around. No matter what, we should honor Phoenix Colden as the brilliant woman she was, a hugely talented fencer and a beacon of compassion and soulful energy, making people laugh while forging interest across culture, academics, and art. She was a marvelous musician, able to play a variety of instruments, ranging from guitar to piano. In fact, Gloria's piano sits untouched to this day, collecting dust, waiting to be played again, by the girl who expressed herself so beautifully for 23 years. The piano waits for Phoenix Colden, just like us, as we climb the uphill battle in fighting to solve her disappearance, and the mystery scene at St. Clair Avenue. This has been Cold Case Detective.